So hi, everybody. I'm going to be talking today about a couple of the challenges that you run into when you're running long-running web automation tasks. Uh, in particular, the fact that web data is constantly, constantly changing, even during the course of a single execution. And also the fact that at any given point, the network, the server, your own computer can go down, and you're going to have to actually recover from that failure. So I'm going to introduce a construct called the skip block that we actually use to handle these sorts of issues. So I'm going to start by asserting that there are two kinds of people in the world. There are the people who already care about data today, and there's everybody else who is going to care about data tomorrow. And so I think this is one really important trend, that we're seeing more and more people starting to actually care about collecting and analyzing data. But what's even more interesting to me is that we're starting to see more and more non-coders get interested into this. Uh, if you were the keynote this morning, you heard that non-coders are really interested in using their computers to collect information, and that right now they don't really especially have good tools to do so. And I think that's especially true in the case of collecting web data. So there are a ton of tools that are available out there for coders, all of the familiar scraping languages and libraries that you already know. Uh, the unifying thing here is that in order to use them, you actually have to know how to reverse engineer web pages. So you have to understand the structure of the DOM for the pages you're using, the structure of the JavaScript code, how it's actually interacting with the server. And that's not really a reasonable thing to expect of non-coders. So for non-coders, your options are essentially hire a human who's going to sit in front of the browser and copy and paste, hire a coder who's going to use one of the tools from the other box, or more recently, you can use our tool Helena, which allows you to use programming by demonstration to build large and complex uh, scraping scripts. So this is part of a longer line of research on the Helena web automation language and the associated programming by demonstration tool. I'm going to take a quick moment to explain how we go from demonstration to program. So basically, say you want to build a script that is going to scrape all the papers by the top 10,000 CF authors from Google Scholar. Uh, basically, what's going to happen if you want to build this with our tool is you are going to show us how you would actually scrape the first row of that data set. And what we're going to build is the script that's actually going to scrape the next 3 million rows. So we'll go ahead and load up that first page. This tool is already starting to build up a representation of what you have done. So it's indicated that you have already loaded something. We'll grab some information about that first author. We will click on the author to get to the list of papers. We'll grab some information about the first paper, the title, the citations, and the year. Now at this point, we have done all the things that we actually wanted to do to collect that first row of data. Helena is going to do a little processing, and it's going to figure out where to insert loops. So it says, OK, you interacted with that first author. Maybe you want to interact with all of them. Same deal with papers. So that's where we're actually getting these programs. What I want to talk about today is actually what can trip up these programs, and what should we do when that does happen. So we started giving this tool out to a bunch of different people from a bunch of different backgrounds. And this was one group. They were sociologists. They had a contract with the city of Seattle to study how rent is changing across various Seattle neighborhoods. Um, their idea, scrape Craigslist once a night, seems pretty straightforward, seems like a great way to collect this information. And we were all ready, we had just come off designing Helena and the underlying record and replay tool, so we thought, okay, the problems that they're going to face is going to be something like, oh, they can't find this piece of data on this particular page, the same sort of stuff that we had already spent so much time figuring out. And it turns out the issues weren't anything like that. The issue was the person who was actually running this scrape was running it on his home laptop connected to his home Wi-Fi, and he'd set it running in the evening, and by the time he woke up in the morning, the Wi-Fi had gone down. And he would realize that it had gone down, check it, set it up to restart again, and it would have to go through all the work it had already done the night before, and finally then actually finish the scrape. And what was actually even more annoying was that even when the network was well behaved, it was still wasting a lot of time scraping the same items just because of the way Craigslist does pagination. So the way it does it is when you press the next button to get to the next results, it indexes into the current master list of results. So if three items have been posted to Craigslist between the time when you loaded page one and the time when you loaded page two, everything is pushed back three slots. The last three items from page one are now the beginning of page two, and you see them again. Now, this is not really a big deal, right? You get a few repeats, but it turns out that Craigslist is getting so much new data so quickly that the script was wasting 10 hours a day just scraping the same stuff it had already scraped that same day. And that started to seem pretty ridiculous. That doesn't seem like a reasonable thing to be doing. So we were giving it out to a bunch of people, a bunch of different tasks, a bunch of different sites, and we kept seeing variations of these exact same problems over and over again. So it was failures. The network fails, the server fails, or the computer fails, and we have to start over and redo a bunch of work. Or it was data changes. So you're not getting a single atomic read that is producing all of the pages you're loading over the course of the scrape. Instead, you're getting one read of the underlying data source per web page that you load. And so what I want you to notice about these problems is these are not actually client-side problems. These are not problems with the scripts that we're producing. The scraping script is never going to be able to prevent the server from going down, or the network from going down, or the server from serving whatever it wants to serve to you. 
So if we can't actually prevent that from happening, we have to go ahead and just handle it gracefully. And so that's what we did. We introduced a construct called the skip block, and we asked users to introduce skip blocks into their Helena programs. Uh, this might seem a little surprising, right? Because I've just talked about these two different problems that seem probably pretty different on the surface of it. But I'm saying that we're actually going to fix it with one construct. And the reason is that all we really want to tell the script is to just don't redo the same work you've already done, right? It's, you can't avoid these failures. There are a bunch of communicating machines. The web is messy. Like, failures will happen. That's OK. What's annoying about it was the fact that we were having to repeat all this work when we got the failures. So we just want to tell it to not do that. Same deal with data changes. You know, if you get some duplicates in your Chrysler scrape, not a big deal. We can do some post-processing. What was annoying about this was the fact that we were repeating work. So that's what we want to tell the script not to do. But this is complicated because then how do you define the same work? After all, one of the things I've been talking about is the fact that the data is changing constantly. So you get back to item two on that Craigslist page, and all of a sudden item two is down at item five, and item two is some totally other thing we've never seen before. Or we get to Twitter, and item two, well, it has the same tweet text, but there's this other attribute called retweets, and that has changed. Does that mean it's a different object? Is it still the same object? And so our answer is to let the user actually tell us what makes an object the same and to also associate the block of code that is going to actually interact with that object. And so basically, when we get to an actual new object, our runtime is going to check whether we have already committed or memoized some information about that object. If we have, we can go ahead and skip the associated chunk of code. If we haven't, then we will go ahead and actually run it like normal. And the great thing about this approach is that there's no reverse engineering required. We are not asking the user to reason about any of that low-level stuff. They just have to think about this high-level output data that they have already thought about because they've already told us what they want in the output data set. OK, so it's clear how this is going to help us handle duplicates, right? We see that duplicate listing from Craigslist. We go ahead and skip over it. That's pretty straightforward. But how does this help us handle failures? So here's the textified representation of that same program that we've been dealing with. It grabs some author information, some paper information, adds it to our output data set. All we're going to do now is slot in a skip block. And what this is telling us is that if we see an author that has the same name and the same institution as an author we've seen in the past, then we should assume that it is, in fact, the same author. And then we have the block, which is associated with the author. So this is doing everything that we want to do with that author object, grabbing info about the author, grabbing info about all the papers of the author. And basically, this is what we're going to want to skip if we have actually already done the work associated with this author in any of the runs of this script at any point in the past. OK, so here's our author scope. Here's our paper scope. How does it look on a timeline? We start with a page load represented by that little black circle. That gets us the author list. We click on the first author. That's going to bring us to another page load that will get us the author-specific page and a set of the first papers by that author. And then we'll get another page load to get to the next papers, and another page load, on and on and on, until we've gotten all the page loads for um, that first author, all of their papers. And at that point, we're ready to actually commit the block associated with author one. One of the things I want you to notice here is that there's always going to be at least one page load per author, because that's how we get to that paper list, the author-specific page. But we're often, just because there are so many authors associated with each of these top authors, uh, so many papers associated with these top authors, top authors they're often about 40 page loads. So now when we get to a, a somewhat longer timeline and we introduce a failure, you know, the network goes down, um, how can we actually recover? So without skip blocks, we're just going to have to go back and do the exact same work that we did to get there in the first place. So we're going to go through all those authors and we're going to go through all those papers and it's going to be pretty time consuming. On the other hand, if we did have skip blocks in our script, we are going to be able to skip over each of the authors that we already committed. Um, Basically, this means that for each of those authors that we're skipping, we're skipping about 40 page loads. So by the time we get to that last one that we had committed, we've actually still only seen the one page load that we did to get the author list. And we haven't had to do any of the 200 that we would have had to do to grab all of the papers that were in the intervening space. Um, so that's a pretty big difference, 1 to 200. And of course, you know, this is only five authors. It's not a huge difference. But by the time you're on the 5,000th author, this is actually going to save you a lot of time. And so basically what we're doing is just fast forwarding over the work that we've already done in the past. OK, so in the question of authors versus papers, it's clear we probably want to have the skip block at the author's level. That's going to save us the most time. But what about if we're trying to scrape a bunch of reviews for a bunch of restaurants across a bunch of cities? If we have the skip block at the level of the city, you know, scraping a single city takes hours. So it's all well and good to be able to skip directly to the failure city, but you're still going to take hours getting back to the particular restaurant where you failed. On the other hand, if you have the skip block only at the restaurant level, you know, there are thousands of restaurants associated with each city. So just going through all the restaurants for all the cities prior to the city where you failed, that's going to take a really long time. So of course, what you really want is to actually have a skip block at both levels to have basically nested skip blocks. 
And that's what's going to give you that adjusted granularity skipping that's going to allow you to really fast forward right to the point of failure. So basically the idea is you'll skip over cities as long as you can, then you can drop back down to skipping over restaurants until you reach where you failed. And so this is how a nested skip block could look in the context of that author and paper script that we've been dealing with. Nothing too crazy, we're just adding another skip block in the, the paper scope. Now the important thing here is in order to get that adjustable granularity skipping, we do have to be able to commit the inner blocks even if the outer block does not commit. So in that sense, it's somewhat like a nested open transaction. Okay, so the way we've been doing it, skipping an object, if we have ever seen it ever in the past, makes a lot of sense if we're coming back a week later and we don't expect that the authors will have published much new work. But if we're scraping this every single week, and now it's been a year since we scraped a particular author, they might have published something new at that point. So at that point, maybe we want to go in and add a different staleness threshold. Here we've changed the staleness threshold to, hey, if it's been a year, go back in, see if there's anything new. We can still skip over all the papers that we've already seen in the past, but we want to at least see if there's anything new for the authors. And so you can see we have the different staleness constraints for the different blocks that will allow us to do exactly that. We can also use logical time. We can say something like, if you haven't scraped it in the last three runs, that's when we want to go back and refresh. Um, so this is really cool, right? So we've already talked about how we can get handle data redundancy and failure recovery. And this is actually telling us that we get this whole other feature basically for free by having the skip block. So this is basically going to allow us to refresh our data set over time if we're doing longitudinal scraping, um, doing it incrementally, not having to repeat all the work, which is definitely a desirable feature for a scraping language. So at this point, it's demo time. Let's actually see how we would build that Google Scholar script that we've been playing with. So we have pulled up the Helena Chrome extension. We are loading up that first page. We're going to go ahead and grab some information about the first author's first paper. And at that point, we will be done with our recording. Uh, it's writing the program right now. It's already added the author's loop, now the paper's loop. We are going to go back in and actually add a skip block. So we'll say, if there is a paper that has the same publication year and the same title text, that means it's probably the same paper. And so you can see we've added this red skip block that you see up in the script there. We will start it running. What we're going to see on the left in that panel there is an overview of the data we've collected so far. We're going to cut it off after 10. Okay, so that means that when we come back and run it again, we should skip over those 10 since we've already seen them, and we should skip directly to number 11. And so if we take a look at the data this time, yeah, we see that iteration counter over on the right shows that we started at 11. So now let's go back, change the skip block. Let's say skip anything that was scraped in the last execution. So that means we should re-scrape the first 10, skip the next 10, and then carry on. And so if we actually watch the data that's going to come in, yep, we re-scrape the first 10, skip to the next 10, start it again. All right, that's exactly what we wanted, and we'll go back to our talk. Okay, eval. Uh, there were no existing benchmark suites of long-running web scraping tasks, so we emailed a mailing list with a bunch of different social scientists from different backgrounds and asked them who needs web data. The end result was seven long-running web scraping tasks. Uh, for example, uh, for the top 50 foundations, scrape the last 1,000 tweets. Uh, we've already talked about uh, scraping all of the Seattle apartments listings from Craigslist. And we're going to look at how those um, are actually affected in each of our three scenarios by the use of skip blocks. So first, data change, so that's thinking about the cases where we were seeing those duplicate Craigslist ads uh, within a single run. And we're going to look at basically the performance of a script with skip blocks versus without, and we'll compare that Twitter and that Craigslist example. What we can see is Twitter is basically the worst of all worlds for us. Um, we're seeing all the overhead with none of the games because by the time you reach the tweet, there are no extra page loads you have to do for that tweet. All the information is already there. You're not able to skip anything really important, but you're still having all the overhead of actually talking to a remote commit log. And over here, what we have in the Craigslist example, we already know that there are a bunch of duplicates in that case. And so because we're having such high data turnover and because we are able to skip one page load per ad that we skip, we're actually saving a lot of time. So that's advanced uh, our, our situation there a lot. On to data rescraping. So when we want to go back and refresh one week later, um, how are we doing if we have skip blocks versus if we have to rescrape everything? And here the situation has actually reversed. So now Twitter is one of the stars with 49x speed up because it turns out between last week and this week, the Gates Foundation probably didn't post that many new tweets in a week. So we were actually getting a lot of benefit from having last week's scrape already. Whereas in the case of Craigslist, there is so much data turnover, you know, all of the listings are basically new one week later, so we're not getting that much added benefit from having last week's data. We're still seeing about the same speed up that we saw that first time, but we're not getting anything especially extra. Okay, how does this handle failure recovery? So basically here what we look at as how are we going to recover if we just naively restart and have to get back to the same point? 
How are we going to recover if we have skip block based fast forwarding? And then we normalize the execution times based on a magical ideal script that can recover in exactly zero seconds because it's our idea. It basically saw no simulated failures, so it got to cheat. Um, and what we can see is that we're actually getting quite close to the ideal time. So for each benchmark, we looked at three failure points, one quarter of the way, halfway through, and three quarters of the way through. And overall, we're getting pretty close to our ideal time, um, except in the case of Craigslist. So basically, Craigslist is one of the ones where we're seeing high data churn. So by the time we go back to recover, we are already getting new data. And so that means that we're not going to be able to skip over the, all the old data, so our recovery is not going to be as fast. But on the other hand, we get more data, so it's not such a bad situation. We were also interested in whether this construct is actually usable. So we grabbed the UI from the Helena tool, stuck it right into an online survey, and basically asked a bunch of strangers <laughs> to write eight skip blocks. So we were interested in a couple of different errors that those skip blocks could then make. So the skip blocks could choose to keep rows that should have been skipped, or they could choose to skip rows that should have been kept. It turns out the first error, no one makes that. Everyone's fine on that. On the other hand, the cases where you are skipping rows that should have been kept, that is actually an error that we end up seeing. I'll give you an example of basically the worst case for us. So this was some Yelp menu items. Uh, when you look at this, it seems very reasonable to say, oh yeah, all the menu items are going to have a different description. I can just rely on that attribute. But it turns out a lot of the data looks like this, and so all the ones who are relying on description basically told us that all of the menu items with no description were the same object, which of course is not quite right. Excitingly, the difference between coders and non-coders was not statistically significant. So we thought that was kind of interesting. We actually expected that it would be. Um, we were also really excited by just how quickly people learned this task. So this was all in the context of a 12-minute online survey. They took four minutes to learn what, scrape, what skip blocks actually were, and they took one minute each to write each of these eight really quite good skip blocks that were seeing few errors. So the fact that we were able to get less than 3% error rates in the context of a 12-minute online survey was really exciting for us. OK, a couple quick takeaway messages. Uh, we were able to handle three pretty different problems with a single pretty simple language construct. And by keeping the level of the reasoning at the level of the target output data, we were actually able to make them usable by non-coders, which we thought was pretty exciting. And with that, I would love to take any questions. <laughs>